Hi, and you're very welcome back to the League of Ireland podcast here on FinalWhistle.ie. It's episode eight. My name is Brefney Early, and I'm joined as ever for an even number podcast with Dean Zambra, captain of Longford Town. It's been a rough week for you, Dean, but you haven't been featuring. You've uh, picked up a bit of an injury. Tell us about it. Yeah, I just picked up a knock in training um, last week, so they uh, reeled me out of the draw the game, and the Rovers came down as well, so... Still working on some rehab stuff, hoping to to feature again soon. Um, but um, always disappointing to pick up a niggly injury, you know, like that. Um, because you're not quite sure when you're when you're back or when you're ready to be back. So um, hopefully sooner rather than later. Okay, now we do have a bumper show for you today, but just a reminder, uh, wherever you're listening to this or watching this, you can watch us on YouTube or you can listen to us on any good podcast platform, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever. Just look up Final Whistle League of Ireland and don't forget to subscribe. We love having you here week on week. Uh, Huge response to last week's show. We had John Gill, of course, on the show. Also, John Caulfield, two former adversaries at Dundalk and Cork. Now, of course, John, uh, looking at the, I suppose, the situation in Dundalk. We're going to talk a bit about that as well, Dean. Um, But maybe let's start there with the news. There's a couple of big things happen this week. Graham Burke scored an absolute worldly um, from the halfway line against Derry on Tuesday night for Shamrock Rovers. And then we seem to have a bit of chaos at Dundalk. Um, departures, we're not quite sure what's happening. There's rumours today as we record this on Sunday afternoon that uh, Filippo and uh, Giov- uh, Giovanni Rossi have also uh, stepped away from the club. Um, and then finally, I suppose, there's a bit of confusion about maybe one or two players' positions at Waterford with the Brian Murphy issuing a couple of strange statements, just strange given the context and and given the situation down there. Um, It's just, it's all a bit crazy, but it's great from the supporters' point of view, plenty to talk about. It's the greatest league in the world, isn't it, as they say? So, you know, it didn't have to wait long for these uh, headlines to be thrown up and to get right back into the the turmoil of a League of Ireland season, did we? Well, we're going to talk about the, the Graham Burke goal later on the show with one of our guests, Graham Merrigan. Uh, we'll also be joined also by Cove Ramblers first team coach, uh, James Claffey, who's also a, a psych- psychological consultant who will be chatting about his role and the role of that profession within the game. But let's maybe talk about those two, first of all. We have to start with Dundalk because it just seems to be an absolute mess up there in Oriel Park at the moment. We touched on it last week with John Gill. Uh, what's your thoughts on what's gone on so far over the last three days, maybe since we first heard whispers that Shane Keegan was leaving uh, the club? Yeah, I think uh, League of Ireland people in general are kind of a bit bemused as to what the structure was there in terms of the management team, you know. So looking from the outside, um, we all thought it was peculiar that, you know, Shane Keegan, was he the manager? Was he not? Was he there in name only? You know, was it Filippo? I think outside we didn't know. Uh, I know you spoke to Jim Jilton earlier in the season and like he assured us that, you know, everything was on the right path and that they had the structure in place that they wanted. But after a, uh, a slow start to the season, it doesn't seem like they do. So it'll be interesting to see where they go with that. Um like you mentioned, there's rumours that Filippo's going to step away then as well, so they'll need a whole new management team if that happens. Well, that was confirmed this morning by LMFM uh, about an hour before we started recording it. Uh, they did put a uh, statement on the radio, or not a statement on the radio, but the radio did confirm that has been the case. Uh, the players met with Filippo Sunday morning, and the decision has been made that they've both moved away from the club. So um, I know Jim, after the game yesterday, was quoted as saying uh, they'd be sorting it all out in the next 48 hours or so so we expect to maybe hear from the club maybe before this uh, podcast even hits the airwaves uh, but it's it's just it's carnage yeah it seems like um i'm just thinking from the players point of view you know like what what are they you know what are they going through like they're trying to prepare for games they're trying to win games i'm sure the the expectation within the dressing room was that they should be challenging for for honors this season and especially a, a european campaign coming up so that's a lot of turmoil for them to deal with um, in getting ready for a game. And at this point now, we don't know who's going to come in. So it leaves everything up in the air and it leaves the players out on a limb, really, in terms of trying to prepare for their next game. Like, who takes the, the session? Who sets out the team? Who picks the team? Like, we've heard rumours that the the owner has been involved in that uh, over the last kind of 18 months. So who's going to pick the team for the next game? We don't know at this po- at this point. Yeah, I think and it's important to say that there are two sides to this story as well. We have the side that 
that the supporters are, are kind of thriving on and and that we're all kind of focused on, which is the departures and the, the seemingly chaos. But if you try and put yourself in the point of view of the of the owner, we're all aware over the years with our own clubs that there are issues within clubs of how things are done and maybe uh, the standards aren't quite what we'd like them to be across the board in a lot of clubs for for small stuff but when you start adding it all together and and maybe we've got the end the wrong end of this i suspect we haven't but there is also that opportunity to, to look at it from the point of view of saying well maybe they've raised the standards and the people that they had hired to do that weren't good enough for them and they've tried to get them out but then it brings in all kind of constructive dismissal stuff and it's it's just it's not good for the image of the club it's not good for the image of the league i do think they've got a really good solid pair of hands there in jim magilton and i think if he's given the the time and the support and the role and the freedom potentially to do the job that needs to be done there i think there's a really bright future for dundalk because let's face it, they're not in the worst position. They're cash positive. They've got a good record in Europe. They're in Europe again this season. Um, most of their problems can potentially be fixed in the first team, at least, with a decent transfer window. Um, they've got some really good players in. Oh, maybe I'm being a bit too kind to them. I don't know. But I don't think it's as bad as it's as it potentially could be. I do know. I do think the chairman, and we'd love to have him on if he's listening to this and he wants to come on and have a chat, we're more than happy to give you the platform to come and have a chat with us about your vision for Dundalk and, and where you want to take it as the, the chairman of the club. Uh, do like get in touch. Just hit us up. Final whistle anywhere on social media, you'll find us. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. I don't know. I suppose as a player within the league, it's very difficult for you to kind of comment on that, Dean. But um, if they came looking to someone, if you were advising someone who was they were looking at now, would you be suggesting they sign for Dundalk? Well, I still think, like you said, there's a lot of positives there with Dundalk, and they've definitely been the standard bearer in the league for six or seven years in terms of, you know, even like pro contracts, 52 week contracts that they're paying the players. So I wouldn't dismiss an opportunity, like if I was advising a player or, or someone was looking for that sort of advice from me in terms of going there. But I think players will probably ask questions about who's in charge who's managing, what's the vision, uh, where are we going, what are we trying to do? And the other thing is your, your, your game's into the season now. It's very early in the season. There's no, absolutely no reason why they couldn't turn around a poor start and go on a good run. But you don't want to get so far into the season that you're, you're out of contention. And I think specifically for Dundalk, they don't want to be out of Europe next year. Um, I'm sure they'll, they'll make a good run at, uh, at this year's competition but you don't want to you don't want to not qualify for next year because a lot of these projects with Shamrock Rovers Dundalk they're kind of based upon gradual progression in Europe every year and usually the next frontier for all these clubs is is to break into the European competitions so you don't want to you don't want to skip out a year of that having put in so much work and so much effort over the last few years to to be at that level kind of and plan to be at that level every year you don't want to miss one out yeah, I, I do think that the quality in the squad there, the likes of Chris Shields, the likes of Mickey Duffy and those lads, um, I do think they'll be they'll be at least fourth at the end of the season. I don't think they'll miss out. Uh, but it is a bit of a worry when you look at the table now uh, as to what might be coming ahead. But there's still 31 games left in the season. I wouldn't be getting the 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 smoke signals out just yet uh, for looking for the the alarm. I think it I think it'll be okay. Uh, moving on to the situation in Waterford because uh, we had the bizarre situation where two players just, I suppose, disappeared from the team sheet on uh, on Friday. No explanation as to why they weren't included. Uh, Brian Murphy, Oscar Brennan, rumours of a fight uh, between either themselves or with the management on, on Friday. It, it came out, uh, Brian issued a statement himself saying um, that he had had words with the management and that uh, he wasn't told why he was left out himself. Um is that something to worry about? Because Brian Murphy is hugely important to, to what they're doing down there. Yeah, I think potentially it could be a little bit. Um, obviously a very good goalkeeper and experienced player. And I just think it seemed like a strange, a bizarre situation, really. Like he, he, probably your best player, really, overall, um, not being included in the team. And according to his own his own statement, you know, he wasn't he wasn't um, told really, but he, he said he remains available for selection. Again, I think you mentioned it yourself. Sometimes from the outside, you think, "Oh, this is a crisis," and they're they're melting down. And probably it's not as bad. And again, he's a good football person. I'm sure they'll have a chat down there this week and, and iron it out. And 
I would expect to see kind of Oscar and, and Brian back involved and I don't see that developing into too much more but you know it's always a concern and like I said from the outside we're not too sure what's going on but we're looking and kind of saying oh it doesn't seem it doesn't seem great but uh, time will tell it'll be the next kind of couple of weeks to see if it, if anything clears up in relation to Oscar they said it was an injury so I think we have to take them at face value uh, that he wasn't available for the game because of that and and if there's anything further I'm sure we'll find out in the coming weeks. Yeah, I suppose all these things do come out in the wash. And I think I think there's a little bit of that sensationalism coming into it as well. The the fact that we now have much more access to to dressing rooms via players and and via I suppose social media and even the watch LOI and LOI TV bringing us to every game we want. We're consuming more information on the league, which I think initially we've kind of gone a bit tabloidy on it but i think in the long term it's going to be very positive for the clubs and the players and the league in general uh, in, in terms of the actual fixtures though plenty of games played this week uh, we had a midweek game between shamrock rovers and Derry. Uh, that was settled fairly straightforwardly in the end uh shamrock rovers took all two points the highlight of the game i suppose being a a great goal by graham burke from the halfway line um opportunism or technique beyond compare um, probably a bit of both. Like I think, um, quick thinking, good intelligence, um, and good technique to strike the ball like from that far, obviously, and good accuracy to score the goal. Um, but um, just just you know, opportunism probably overrides everything else because he just seen the chance, cut the keeper off guard, and usually you know the top players in the league are the fellas that you see doing that kind of thing. Like we only done it a couple of times across the water. Like it's just people that are kind of thinking that a little bit quicker. And we've seen Graham Burke doing that in different situations, not necessarily just that, but um, he was obviously sharp and tuned into the situation. And uh, it was a great goal. Brilliant, brilliant to watch on, on um, the highlights, you know. So um, one to remember for him anyway. Yeah, Derry did get their season up and running. Finally, their first positive result of the season with a one-all draw against Drogheda on Friday night at the Brandywell as well. Uh, James Brown, he's impressed me this year. He was in the right place at the right time. Uh, st- struck it nicely, uh, but really couldn't miss from that range, surely. Yeah, I just... Actually, he's a right back and he ended up in the in the six-yard box, didn't he? Like So um, he's been really good. He was good against us last week. And I was talking to Tim Clancy um, last week before the game and he said, you know, he's been brilliant for them. Connor Kane's been brilliant for them. They've got... Um, a lot of publicity about lads they brought in, but I think Tim was saying they're very, very pleased with the lads that got them there as well because they've really continued their good form from last year and stepped up again another level. And James is obviously one of those guys. And if he's chipping in goals from that uh, right back spot as well, like they'll be, they'll be thrilled. I think it's his uh, one goal and two assists so far this season. It's not bad in in the first five games of the season. Uh, Derry must be delighted to be up and running though. First game of the first point of the season. It's really beginning to, p- to pile up the pressure. Now they faced on Dock at the weekend. Um, I, I don't like piling in on managers when they're having bad times. I think De- Declan Devine's done well before. He'll do well again. Um, but it's a rough patch for Derry at the moment. Yeah, a little bit. Um, again, it's not. It's not maybe headline thing, headline material that we're coming out with. But it's a long, long way to go and. I'm sure Decky will get the, the ship right when when he has a little bit of time, you know, to, to gel the players. A lot of young lads, a um, couple of new lads in there. So once they settle down, they'll probably look at the Dundalk game and say, we've a great chance of getting three points here. Why wouldn't they? Like, you know, and that might be the one that turns it around for them and might be the one that kickstarts for them. So, yeah, look, they're not miles away. Um, it's been a little bit of a rough start, but point on the board gets them going and they go into the next game with a little bit more confidence now. Yeah, the other Friday evening game, of course, we've touched on it briefly with the, the Kevin Sheedy and Brian Murphy discussion, but uh, Waterford 1-0 defeat to Bohemians. Rob Cornwell with a, a goal in that game to settle matters. Uh, Bowes picking up a few points finally. Yeah, I think quietly just uh, been a little bit better the last couple of weeks and I had no doubt with Keith and, and Trevor there that they'd get they get the lads going eventually. Um, they look stout, which is good. Like They look solid. Um didn't give away a lot against Waterford and obviously nicked the goal and um they'll move up the table quickly if they're gonna if they're gonna get you know result, more results like that where boy they're kind of maybe not blowing teams away but they're getting the right results and they and they look good and they look stout and they look like you know they're a little bit back to last year's form whereby they're winning the games they should win you know and then of course on Saturday evening three games uh, all three teams that won these games uh, or not 
won them but, but came out with results in this game because Pats didn't quite manage to win in the end a uh, late Dundalk equaliser cancelled that out but three teams coming out of these games at the top of the table on points over the weekend uh, we start maybe in the showground Sligo Rovers Finn Harps Northwest Derby uh, Johnny Kenny scored but was it more so Johnny Kenny's first goal for the club or was it Mark Anthony McGinley's mistake that handed it to the youngster on a plate yeah, I think so. And I think he knew himself straight away. Like, um, just took a little bit too long in it. But good uh, enthusiasm um, to close the ball down. You know, some strikers won't. So you go back to the keeper, just kind of, ah, you know, I'll, I'll take I'll take a breather here. But he followed it in. He got his rewards. And, you know, I'm sure Liam's delighted to, uh, to get him off the, the mark, like, with that with that goal. So Sligo just kind of uh, chugging away nicely as well, kind of grinding out wins and, and getting good results. And, and they look hard to beat, they look hard to score against, which again is, you know, makes for uh, good reading for them, for their fans going forward, that um, they're not giving away anything and they're nicking goals and they're getting results. So I'm sure Liam's uh, delighted so far. Yeah, the back four, back five, even uh, pretty watertight back there. It's been a, it's been a feature of the that side for the last two or three seasons. Uh, they're just tough to score against, and once you once you can't don't concede that many, uh, you're tough to beat. In terms of the other games that were played, we'll, we'll come back to the Shamrock Rovers Longford Town game in a minute. Finish on that because I know you were involved in that one, or at least at that game. Uh, Dundalk versus Pats. Uh, they left it late. A former Sligo Rovers player, junior, managed to pull one out of the fire for them, uh, but they'll be. I suppose, but just this game was more about what was happening off the pitch than on the pitch on Saturday evening. Yeah, a lot of distractions for the players, and um, probably not too disappointed with a point in the end coming over. Like especially late scoring late on, get an equaliser. Um, again, I thought Pat's were impressive. You know, a lot of good players there. They look well organised. They look fit, which we've said a couple of times about um, the other games. Like they've hit the ground running. Um, I'm sure, Stevens delighted with them. Probably. Would have liked them to hold on for the for the three, but on the balance of the game, maybe a draw was a fair result. But not a bad point for either side. Um, and you know, for Dundalk again, we said it's not it's not quite a crisis. Um, it's a point, and they'll, they'll look to push on and and start racking up three points in in the future games. And then your own side, of course, in Tala, Shamrock Rovers, Longford Town. Um, I think it's fair to say at the start of the season, both teams would have been most people's predictions for first and last in the table. But the game didn't show that at all on Saturday evening. Longford won up from a Dylan Gribes penalty after seven or eight minutes. It took Shamrock Rovers a long time to get back into the game, despite probably dominating the game, possession territory and and just control. Um, disappointment to lose it in the manner you did? 93rd minute um, effort from Sean Gannon on the edge of the box? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I thought we'd done all the hard work throughout the game and I think probably Dara's going to be a little bit disappointed with it, with a couple of the decisions that went against us that got uh, Rovers back in the game. Like, you know, like you said, they they controlled the game and the tempo and the possession but didn't really create any chances. I can... Um, I think we were we were a little disappointed that you know both the decisions kind of went against us that ended up in goals, the penalty for one, and then a free kick on the edge of the box, which ends up being kind of shot in from the from the edge with a, a couple of deflections. So overall, I think we've done more than enough to get at least a point in the game. But I think maybe going forward, we would like to have played just a little bit more because I think there was a number of chances to to break uh, at Chamber Crawfords that we didn't take. And probably needed to get a second goal at some point in the game to secure to secure a result. But um, good performance overall from us. But when you're playing the top teams in the league, you have to you have to finish them off, and you have to really give them no chance to get back in. And that goes right up to the 94, 95th, 96th minute, whatever it is. So uh, that's why they're champions. That's what what people will say. Like they get a goal in in the last minute to win a game that probably didn't deserve to overall. But that's why um, that's why they come out on top at the end of the season because you get three points in those games you know yeah Gannon strike at the very end of the game as well from looking at it it was a strange one it seemed to hit maybe three players on the way into the back of the net um I couldn't make out who was actually making the initial challenge but then it clipped their heel and then hit a Durvin maybe and then the keeper got a touch as well before it yeah. kind of I couldn't really follow the trajectory of the ball it seemed to just be everywhere pinball a little bit but they all count unfortunately from a Longford point of view yeah, sure. I was the same in the stand, trying to see who, where it's gone, who it's hitting, how it's gone in, how it ended up in the net. But like I said, it must have, it must have hit three or four different different people. Like, and I think it's one sided Mick a little bit. Or he he hasn't seen it till very very late after a couple of a couple of little knocks, and he just couldn't keep it out. And 
like I said, it's disappointment for us. Um, if I look at it from you know a league point of view, that's what that's what champions do, isn't it? They score late on, and um, we need to we need to do better, like to make sure we get a result. But you can see why clubs like Shamrock Rovers end up winning league titles. Yeah, and I suppose the, the the two penalties, same two players vying at different parts of the, of the ground, Aaron Dobbs, Pico Lopez. For me, I'm not sure if either of them were penalties. I know the, the Rovers one seemed very, very soft. Uh, there's probably more in the first one, but I think Aaron probably put himself in a position that Pico had to foul him rather than actual intention from Pico Lopez, if that's fair. Yeah, I think he obviously pinched the ball off Pico and raced through on goal and uh, Pico's come back at him. I don't, I don't know if he's like tried to upend him or anything like that. I think he's just trying to get back on, on side on with him and try and make a block or try and put him off a little bit. I think he's he's clearly fouled him in the end. But um, on the other one, uh, again, hard to really see from from my trajectory. But uh, like Aaron Dobbs is insistent that there's there's no foul there. You know, Pico's kind of entangled with him, and there didn't seem to be any kind of. Didn't seem to have held from anyone, just a, a tangle in the players, like you know. But again, you're playing away to Shamrock Rovers, the league champions, and someone hits the ground like that in the box, it's nearly always going to get given. So you have to try your very best to put yourself in situations where where those incidents don't happen, you know. Yeah, it seemed to me that uh, I think Pico was going to hit the ground there, no matter what happened. You know, it was like one of those old Gaelic ones where you kind of grab his arm and go down, and it looks as if you both got down together. Uh, referees sometimes give them, sometimes they don't. On this situation, uh, it worked out for Shamrock Rovers. In terms of, I suppose, the weekend game action, one of the I suppose, things I noticed over the weekend, maybe it's as a as a semi-paid-up member of the goalkeepers' union back in the day, um, a lot of change and discussion about goalkeepers. We've talked about Brian Murphy. A BB came in back into the team um, for Dundalk. Um, could he have done more for the Sam Bone header? Who knows? Um, but there was a change as well at the between the sticks for Longford. Uh, Lee Stacey, who's been an ever present for a couple of years now, ever since maybe a small injury um, period where he's out of the team in 2019, he's been in the in the sticks for Longford, and it just didn't. I don't know. Like, can you what can you tell us about that? Because obviously he was left out this weekend. Um, Michael Kelly taking his place between the goalposts. Yeah, well, look, it's a question for Dara, really, but I think uh, overall, just wanted to, to make a change. I don't know whether it was just to freshen up a little bit or, you know, to give Lee a little bit of a breather. I haven't played, like you said, nearly all the games for three years and, and all the opening games as well. So a lot of games coming up, another game on Tuesday. And I think, interestingly enough, we talked to Lee last week about goalkeepers and probably there's two or three very good ones at every club. So there might be a little bit of, you know, not necessarily the same pressure on managers, but they might feel that other keepers deserve a, a run out, you know, from time to time. And uh, being a second choice keeper often means you don't play for the whole season. So maybe some managers are kind of saying, well, if my first choice goes down, I might need the second choice keeper. So I can mix them in here in a couple of different games. And again, something we've kind of seen more so probably in England where they rotate the second goalkeeper in for a couple of games here and there and cup games. So, from our point of view, I don't, I don't know if Dara had decided just to just to freshen things up a little bit, or if he wanted to have a, a look at Mick, you know, in terms of being the number one now going forward. I don't know that would be for, for Dara, but again, Lee, a very good goalkeeper, so I don't think anyone would have any problem if he if he was to come back in at any point. Yeah, I think you talk about a bit of thing in England already this season. There's been four clubs who've had a a change of goalkeeper, Longford being the fourth one on the list uh, Peter Cherry and Abibi have both played for Dundalk Brian Murphy and I thought uh, the young lad that came on for Waterford Paul Martin I thought he was excellent um, he was very unlucky with the free kick he made a phenomenal save and then Rob Cornwall tapped it in and I think he's been really really good um, in terms of uh, what he brought to the game the other evening I was I was very impressed with him um, in terms of the first division let's fly through those results because obviously we've got a lot to get through on today's show um, over the weekend all games played Friday night Wexford FC versus Cove Ramblers 2-1 to Cove Ramblers. We're going to hear from their first team coach in just a little while. James Claff will be joining us later in the show. While Cork City and Shells won three. A fairly uh, solid performance from Shells there to send themselves back up towards the right side of the table from their point of view. Yeah, I think, you know, the last time they are in the first division, they started kind of the same, didn't they? A little bit slower, a couple of draws, things like that. So I'm expecting them to kick on and... That could be a difficult game going down to Turners Cross, you know, especially with a completely changed Cork City side. So I think they've done really well to win it. And I'm sure they're looking on, uh, looking forward to just kicking on and, and racking up the wins now going forward. 
UCD blew away Cabin Teeley, local derby there in South Dublin. Um, Colm Whelan, what, what can you say about him? Three goals, I think, and an assist as well into the mix. Uh, great night for the youngster. Yeah, he looks like a very good goal scorer, a neat and tidy finisher. I've seen someone mention on Twitter that he's the new Jason Bourne, so that's a, a really big, um, you know, really big shoes to fill there. If he ever does become anywhere close to that, I'm sure he'd be delighted. But um, yeah, he looks like he looks like a good player, good goal scorer, and like we say this all the time, UCD always have good players, and nobody should be surprised that they win games and they play good football and they score a lot of goals because you know the quality of players are very good. The Western Derby, Galway and Treaty. Treaty almost with their first win. Galway weren't having any of it. One all final score. Yeah, and uh, like I think Tommy will still be happy with kind of what they've done overall at this point. Um, they've been competitive, which, you know, when we talked to him, he, he said he wanted the lads to be competitive in every game and, and to have a, a footing in the league, like not, not just the Whitten boys. And they've done really well. Um, John probably hasn't got what he wanted from Galway yet, so he'd be looking to to kick them on a little bit more um, in the next few games. So um, competitive game, but, you know, probably probably the right result in the end. And Bray and Athlone. Um, strange game, this. All the goals scored in the first 15 minutes. Two from Curtis Byrne, uh, cancelling out a Dylan Barnett opener for Bray. Athlone Town, top of the league. But probably a game more kind of seen for the last couple of minutes of the match. Uh, a sc- uh, 21 man all in melee in the middle of the game. Nothing really more than handbags, but plenty of cards shown. Uh, yellow cards to a number of players but a red card to Ryan Graydon as well. I don't know how much of this you might have seen yourself or you're probably living locally to Bray. You might have heard a bit about it from your own circles. What's the thoughts? On, um, what's your thoughts or what have you heard about it since the, the game on Friday evening? Yeah, I heard it was just a, like a kind of skirmish and I'm not sure kind of how a load of lads got booked and one lad got sent off, you know, that kind of way. Like it just... Seems like when there's coming together like that, I don't know I don't know who decides. I don't know whether a referee is talking to linesman or fourth official, but someone singled out Ryan Graydon anyway, and he he was the one sent off in the end. But as you mentioned, Curtis Curtis Byrne with the two goals, very good signing for Atlon. They've they've really started well and we weren't sure how they would blend in all the new signings, but they, they look good, look good so far and you know, let's see do they have the legs to keep it going um into the season, you know. Yeah, there was a. I saw the incident at the time, and then I watched it back yesterday a few times just to see if I could find out what was going on. And essentially, there was a, a coming together between, I think it was Shane Barnes and Connor Clifford. I can't remember who fouled who, but there was a bit of an altercation afterwards. And and Barnes caught Clifford by the by the jersey by the scruff of the neck, and um. Everyone just kind of came in. You know yourself, when these things happen, you're in to defend your teammate. But everybody just came in. And I think Ryan Graydon was one of the ones who made the big, the biggest move across the pitch. But yeah. then there was a, he had a bit of a get-together, I think, with, with the original offender, Barnes, uh, off yeah. to the side. And I don't like accusing anyone of, of, thro- of throwing any kind of uh, shapes with their head, but there was movement with the head in the direction of... of um, of um, Barnes, I don't feel he made contact. I don't feel he had any intention to make contact, but he definitely gave the referee and the officials the opportunity. And because they were off to one side and not involved in the, I suppose the, the gaggle of, of of players in the middle, I suppose you get spotted easier. And I think yeah. sometimes the lesson I would take from that, if I was a coach or I was a player, is a if it's the other side of the pitch, and I know. Um, the Bray goalkeeper, Brian Marr, got a book for, for getting involved. He had run 40 yards to get yeah. involved and 20 other, other players had run 40 yards to get involved. Um, maybe just don't get involved. You know, yeah. like Mike Klingerman down the other end was, was announced on the, on the stream that he, he was having a drink of water when, it, when the whole thing was going on. Now, I don't know whether you want to see that from your teammate either, but uh, yeah. maybe he had the right idea. He stayed, got himself out of trouble. But you don't give the referee the opportunity to send you off. Yeah. I think when you make that head movement, that that's the one that kind of triggers the officials to kind of say, oh, I've seen something there with the head. And whether they make contact or not, or whether there's intent or not, that's kind of the image that stays with the official, the head movement, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, and I, think, I, don't think there, I don't think it was an attempt at headbutt. I think it was just, you know, the way sometimes anger and you make movements. And yeah, I think it was just a, a gesture forward and it just got picked up as whatever it was picked up as and he, he saw red. But let's get into the actual meat of the interviews today. We're, we have two guests coming up. We're first going to hear from uh, the first team coach in Cove Ramblers, uh, James Claffey. He's also a psycho- psychology consultant, a sport and exercise 
psychology consultant and he's going to talk about his dual role down there in cove uh, this season and uh, for the last couple of years uh, we'll also hear from graham merrigan who's a member of the what did he say 527 member club at uh, at shamrock rovers uh, the ownership structure there uh, a lifelong fan and well known to most followers in the league of ireland we'll be chatting to the two lads over the next half hour or so now, an interview we've been looking to have for a couple of weeks on the show, and we're delighted to have him on, is first team coach with Cove Ramblers, James Claffey. James, you're very, very welcome to the programme. Thanks, lads. Thanks for having us. Delighted to be here. Now, the reason why we've gone for, for yourself as a member of the team, maybe not a, a star player and, and the manager, is that you have a very different string to your bow and I suppose a, a route into the game. And that's through your role as a sport and exercise psychology consultant and a lecturer on that subject in a number of colleges across the country. And I suppose it's there that maybe we might start the conversation. What exactly is a sports and exercise psychology consultant? It's a great question and it's one that there's probably no specific answer for um, it's certainly one of the things that I'd set off working with athletes, individuals, maybe people who are at the elite end of sport or just in general exercise practitioners. But the first thing to know, and I, I often make a little bit of a joke about it, where I'll put up a picture of Harry Potter with a wand and say, look, don't expect, you know, to a wave of a wand and all of a sudden your team has gone from bottom of one division to the top of the next. It's it's like everything else. There's a process there um, and it's leading in and, and helping with performance and maybe things in the background, like the motivation, goal setting. They're, they're things historically that you would hear coaches referring to when you, you refer to sports psychs, but it's it can be got to do with building that type of culture for growth. Um, and it's not always an easy thing to do as well. Um, and again, it might take someone like a Barcelona, it might take somebody like a Real Madrid to hire a sport and exercise psych, which which most clubs have, but they don't really come out and say it in the public. Now, the reason why I mention that is because it's like attribution bias. If Lionel Messi picked up a bottle tomorrow and was drinking green stuff in it, you'd guarantee that most people across the world would start drinking this green stuff, regardless of knowing what's in it. But so but sport is like that and life is like that. We model um, ourselves on people who are high up in the game, you know, um, and this is what sport and exercise psychology is looking at. Can we create an environment that's uh, conducive to letting players express themselves and grow and develop, not just as players, but as people? And and then you've got you guys, but especially Dean, with the career you've had, you're probably aware that within the structure we have here in this country, we have to have a backup for ourselves. Like most people, particularly in the fourth division, I, I'd say are doing a uh, double job and as such dual career athletes. And um, so for them, they probably have to go to work. They're trying to eat and stay on track within work. And then they're rushing to get to a training session. And the big thing that I always say to, to coaches who are working with is, do you ask your players how they feel when they're arriving the training or how they're feeling? Now, again, people get caught up in this, oh, we're talking about our feelings. It's not even something as simple as that. A small, quick survey, how are we feeling when we're arriving the training? Yeah, not every training session is going to be amazing and everybody's buzzing and all the rest of that. But you have to have some sort of environment set up. And I'm not talking about facilities. I'm not talking about, you know, multi-million pounds spent, like, let's say, Leicester Cities or Liverpool's. What I'm talking about is how people are feeling when they're coming to your session and and our coaches then asking players how do they feel when they're coming to the sessions then again so you're trying to create a culture where players can grow and develop and you know we call particularly um I know Stuart puts a lot of time into making sure players are looked after. If there's stuff going on, he'll definitely inquire and look after that type of stuff. So, you know, it's 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 easy to say, I oh, will bring in somebody who's got a sports like background, but the real prominence of it then is, are you going to back them and listen to what they're saying? Um, and you, you get lucky. I was a young, young guy, went in with a team. The coach seemed on board with it two weeks in i realized it wasn't going to work but you have young practitioners out there who need who need um a job they need they want to be part of professional sports uh, which football is in this country forever saying it you know people have to start believing that as well and you have to make sure that the coach is fully on board with what you're trying to implement because it's like everything else if they're not on board with it um it's not going to work full time you know yeah, interesting there, James. Um, like I've been around the league 12, 13 years and 
never really been exposed to a sports psychologist at all, like with any of the clubs I've been at. Like, do you think uh, it needs to really become more of a mainstream thing? Like, you have a, a goalkeeping coach, you have an SNC coach. Should this be something that kind of every team carries, especially, like you said, uh, at a professional level within the game? Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, you'd know yourself that, look, we've all had our ups and downs. There's a little thing called life that happens to us, you know, and, and whether you're an elite athlete or not, you, you've, you've seen the likes of Michael Phelps come out with mental health problems. You've seen other athletes, Andre Iniesta, probably one of the greatest footballers of all time, come out with mental health problems. So having these type of specialists in that area is fantastic, but they have to be seen. They have to be there. Um, and there is that stigma, and I completely agree with you that, you know, within psychology, there's a thing called white coat syndrome. And it's basically that, you know, people see the white coat and they, they're initiating this stigma or the feeling or the concern or worry around what it entails, because usually it's a doctor or somebody in power. Um, and, and the problem with that then is that people think, why am I seeing a psychologist? What's wrong with me? And, and, and in fact, you're, we've been trying for years and still trying to change that perception. There's nothing wrong here. This is for us to look and see if we can help create a better environment, a better living environment um, for, for everybody. And I think the real reason why it hasn't taken off so much maybe here is that sometimes it's not tangible. So you get your SNC coach. I mean, for me, when I was growing up and, uh, you know, I didn't get to play at the, the, the level you did. But I mean, for me, uh, there was the coach would have done all the SNC stuff. But now clubs are hiring SNC coaches and they do a really valuable job. I don't want this to come across in any way that I'm disputing their, their, their uh, value. The problem with it is you can see all that. You can test it. You can measure it. You know, and the famous one in SNC, if you're, if you're not measuring, you're guessing. And, and the problem with psych is you don't always see the value of it. But eventually down the term or the long term, if the coach is backing it, if the club is backing it, it's sustainable for growth and development. And it's the reason why you'll see Klopp, the reason why you'll see Guardiola talk about the process and focus on the performance because they, they have to have that buy into them things. But for us, that's really difficult, particularly dual athletes, as I said. You might have had a terrible day. You might be worrying about your mortgage. You might be worrying about whether this is sustainable. Am I going to play the weekend? So when players arrive, you have to at least have a session set up that's going to be specific to them, specific to your own goals, your objectives for the week, but then that they're going to enjoy it. Because realistically, if we're going to spend, and we, you know, if you think about your week, I'm sure you're probably training Tuesday, training Thursday, in Friday. You might have a game on a Saturday. You might do recovery. So like that's six of the, the seven days during a week. Uh, uh, and people like to call it amateur. But it, it's far from amateur, and we need to get these specialised experts in the field to come into the game here within the country, and it will grow. I mean, Pippa Grange was with the, the English national team um, for the last World Cup, and obviously everybody was looking at it and thinking, because they, they got through on penals, which they hadn't done historically before. Now, I'm not saying that there's a link there, but what it did was, it opened up the exposure, and then people started to have the conversation about it. The German uh, national team, released information about their sports like so you're hoping that you know by the time four five six years comes around that people are getting more exposed to the, the working along sports like uh, mental fitness coaches whatever you want to call them yeah so in terms of your role i suppose in cove james um your first team coach there does your role include both on and off the pitch things or are you purely there from a sports psych point of view so it'd be when when Stuart took over and um, his assistant is is Declan Coleman and the two of the, the, the guys work closely. So I, I will be in it kind of working with it within that structure as well. And um, part of the coaching setup match day, you know, maybe warm ups, cool down stuff, stuff that's that's connected to performance. So you're, you're looking at stuff around performance base um, and it would be kind of on field. Yeah. But then off-field stuff as well we would have done you know goal set at the start of the season obviously all that stuff would have been done on zoom and um, but yeah most certainly the sessions that you know i'm at all the sessions i would have a part during that session then again and um, so it's it's definitely something where Stuart coming in there has made it more accessible for me as as somebody who had just been through the a license process to get valuable coaching experience on the pitch I always have a, a lot of respect for Cove, James, because uh, always competitive, you know, generally like working with a small budget, but you never get an easy game. And 
Stewart and uh, uh, Stephen before all bringing in players from kind of everywhere just to just to make a competitive squad. Um, it's been a mixed start in terms of results. Do you put any kind of goal on the season? Like you're talking about goal setting there. Do you put any kind of goal on the season for the for the group or the team looking to kind of make the playoffs or are they just you know trying mm-hmm. to make the way game by game type of thing? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, Stuart very much is, you know, he lives in the present. He's very mindful of the present and what's going on during the week. And, and anything there, we set really short-term goals building towards the, the long-term goals. But, like, you know, people can scoff at the idea of this. But, you know, we very much firmly set out at the start of the season. We don't get up out of bed to come second. We, we, we're there to, to be amongst it. If we can win it, great. If not, get in, as you say, at least amongst the playoffs and... Um, and look, it's an interesting one because, you know, the, the pitch in Cove always gets that little bit of stick and it's hard yeah. to play. And, and, and you know, the, 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 the teams like yourselves who would have come down there um, and, you know, even chatting to the likes of Connor Kenna when he, he was with us last season. Like, it's one of them places, but it, you know what? It's it's such a it's such a good ground. It's steeped in tradition and, 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 and that because they had such a successful team through the 80s as well. But it, it's... It, there's just something, as I always say, driving into Cove. It's a it's a beautiful place, um, and and there's there's so much going on. And, and I have to say, in the background, the club have done stellar amount of work in the last couple of years. The things in the community that they've placed, um, initiatives around the community that 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 are away kit the tour jersey with the uh, charity organisation breaking the silence, um phenomenal amount of work in relation to that around the community and they the club deserve massive amount of respect for that and i think the players it's one of them where the the, the club appreciate what the players have been doing and then also the the, the players have been appreciating what the club have done or have been doing excuse me in terms of i suppose the, the results on the pitch so far we might start with the ucd game get that out of the way before we kind of look at more of the positive performances um tough night for everybody associated with the club or is that just taking a look at the, the maybe the actual results too much or was did the result reflect the game really that's what i'm trying to say I, I think I think I'd be lying if I said that the, the the result didn't reflect what happened during the game. Um, I think on the night it was one of them, you know, um, performance contagion. One where where your whole performance just drops and everybody just has one of them nights, and it can happen. You know, we we've seen results within both divisions that have been a little bit strange and a little bit mixed, but. You know what, you know, my dad used to say that the same pen that writes the headlines is the one that writes the obituaries. And it, it, it's so accurate. You know, one one defeat um, amongst, you know, really, I would say, good performances behind that. We just try and look at it as a process. And I know that that, that can seem cliched. It's it's part of it. Where we hurt, where the players hurt. Yeah, we, absolutely we were. Because it wasn't something that we thought, and I know Stuart spoke about this in the press, that it wasn't something he was happy with seeing his team perform that way. But, it, you know, I think we were talking about before, it swings and roundabouts. The week before, Everybody down here, certainly in Cork, was talking about how well we performed against Cork in the game and we should have got this or we should have got that. And you fast forward a week, we've had that disastrous one. Um, and going forward then, we, we played really well in the second half against Treaty and, and maybe could have got the win there. Um, they, they were down to 10 men, played played really well, I have to say, to be fair to them. Um, I think people were probably writing them off prematurely as you know they only have this amount of time to get ready but they've come on come in and done really well and then obviously uh friday night we, we were i'd say we were excellent for about 70 percent of the game and it's just it was just the, the the goal near the end that kind of sullied it particularly for our keeper sean who and, and the back four who are you know they want to get clean sheets as well yeah, in terms of the, the game against Cork, I suppose that's really been the highlight, even though the, the result went against you. Good to have a, a Cork derby back in the league, albeit you'd rather it be in the top division than the first division. In terms of the game, you lost the battle, but you're higher up the table than Cork at the moment, more league points, uh, so you're winning the war. Um, do you take a little bit of solace from that in the last couple of weeks? 
for me absolutely not to be honest I, I don't get caught up in that so obviously you know I'm a Dublin, Dublin man so you can hear him yexing but uh, I'd, I'd imagine the fans are enjoying that side of it as well and, and you know fair play to them it's been a lot, I think it was something like 2008 maybe 2009 the last time they had a Cork Derby in a league game so they certainly enjoyed that we we, we don't look at any one team yeah it's, it, it was a, it, the Derby was good we, we played well we were particularly unlucky at different parts of it and um, but we we really we really done ourselves justice with the performance, and then just with the other side of it, where we we should have maybe got maybe one or two other goals. But yeah, we we you know that that's part of Stewart's culture that he's brought with the team here is that we're we're not bothered with things, you know, and and with other clubs around us in terms of that, you know, obviously it's it's a derby and it's good for the fans, but for us, no, nah, it's just another team really, to be honest. Four points in the last two there away from home, um, James. Going into two home games then, back to back, I know you touched on kind of the ground and bringing teams down there, but I think in fairness, Stewart's playing a different style of football as well. It's not just come down and kind of batter it down your throat all, all game. Yeah. You look at the next two as a, as a chance to kick on again, though, you know, uh, two home games in a row, try to push on, build on the four points. And, and like you said, you just obviously have a great uh, hope and expectations that you'll be up there competing in in the long term yeah yeah absolutely and and you're spot on i think you know when you the home games are one where last season it was just topsy turvy where we'd gone and won away at trotter we'd gone and won away at Galway, we, we'd won away in longford and we we our home form was actually what let us down so that's something again this morning we trained him this morning and Stuart organized something that don't want to be getting the sack here giving away things but Stuart organized stuff so that we can work on something specific to our to our home games as such as well to maintain if we can if we can even you know win half of them it, it, along with the the away form that we had last year we would have been right and I mean right up there you know and um, so we 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 look at the next two games as always. Look, Bray, Bray are a great side. They've got some great players and they have a great manager. Gary's a great guy. Um, so it's going to be a difficult game. Um, but yeah, as you say, we we Stewart's trying to implement something. And I think the board are aware of what he's trying to implement. They're aware it's going to take time. But um, it's a different kind of brand of football as well. And it's, it's certainly exciting to for me as a... I wouldn't say a young coach, but me as a coach going into Cove and, you know, Stuart's a pro license coach and he, he's, he's he's got a wealth of experience. So I get to, I get to learn from him and, and Deck all the time, uh, which is terrific for me, to be honest. In terms of the, the, the club at the moment, I suppose Cove doesn't get many column inches on a national level. What players are coming through the club at the moment that maybe people should keep an eye out for in match reports and uh, on LOI TV across the season? Yeah, it's it's one of them there again where I'd be kind of unsure about who I'd be mentioning. There's certainly young players coming through all the time, and the one thing that you know I always say with Stewart is, yeah, and Cove, you can you look through the 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 the, the um the books there you'll find that players have just come through at all ages in terms of the youth spectrum should i say and the club have, have put you know a lot of emphasis on getting um the structure in place so that we have players from the academy coming through um you know chris o'reilly played on friday night he's come through the academy he was probably the man of the match um kieran griffin who's local lad in, in cove as well he got the goal against cork and he scored last night um and th there's probably a, a a lot of them you know charlie lyons uh daryl walsh it, it i think we've got maybe one or two who would be kind of up the other end in terms of age and i won't mention their names because they won't be happy with me but a lot of the squads and again you know it, I'm in my head there going, Gee, I hope I haven't forgot him or him, but the, there's lots of young, exciting players there um, that they're, they're focusing on, you know, as a team, what can they do? And they're really looking at it in a disciplined way now going forward because that's that's Stewart's mentality of, you know, we, we'll get closer to where we want to be if if each person is aware of what the, the team goals are. And you'll, you'll reach our individual goals then if if the team is performing anyway. 
Yeah, in terms of, I suppose, the just to wrap it up and to bring it back maybe to your own profession, uh, if clubs are interested in learning more, if somebody's watching and maybe interested in getting involved in this themselves, if there's someone maybe looking at going into college or whatever in the next couple of years, or maybe looking to, to retrain for whatever reason, and it's something that's always interested them, where can they find out more information on the, I suppose, the, the profession and maybe where they can they find out more about where they can be taught by you and others on this subject? Yeah, well... Um... The regulatory body in Ireland is the PSI, the Psychological Society of Ireland. So you, you'll always find information on that. Myself, I run a part-time diploma for people who've got a little bit more than it. And the way you said that is spot on, actually, to be honest, Brett. For people who've got a little bit more in an interest and maybe want to get into it, but don't quite know whether they've three or four years to give. There's a 12, 12 week uh, diploma in Ibac College um, that you could look up online um, on the lecturer there. So it's quite popular. And it, as I said, it's, it's people maybe getting into it um, who are, have, have read up on it, have maybe enjoyed it, and then are thinking, I'll take the first step, but I'm not too sure whether it's going to be something for three or four years down the line. And you can always get me on, on Twitter uh, at James Claffey Pride Psychology um, and um, my direct messages are open. I always try to help, you know, young people coming in to, to, to the work within it, within sport and exercise psychology all the time. So feel free if anyone's any questions or queries in relation to that. Excellent. Well, listen, thanks very much for giving up your time after a tough morning out in Cove uh, at training. And thanks for joining us on Saturday, Sunday afternoon as we're talking to you. Um, and the best luck for the rest of the season and that clash with Bray next weekend. Thanks very much, lads. Really appreciate it. Now, myself and Dino are having a chat during the week about who we'd have on the show this week. And he suggested getting a, a Celebrity League of Ireland fan. And I said, Graham Merrigan. And he said, that's exactly who I was thinking of. And he's here joining us now. Uh, he's also, of course, a member of the Shamrock Rovers Management Club in, in, in its purest sense, the 400 Club. But what is it now the 500 Club in, in Shamrock Rovers? 527 Club. 527. That, of course, is the voice of Graham Merrigan. And he joins <laughs> us now. Graham, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Dino. How are you, Meryl? I'm hardly a celeb, so uh, that's just the Zambras. <laughs> you obviously, of course, are um, a podcaster in your own right. What's the Story podcast is very, very popular. This You've had some great interviews in general, but some great League of Ireland interviews on the show over the last maybe five or six years. You've been at that now? Uh, six years coming up to June. Search WTS Pod on any podcast provider. We didn't invite you on for a plug. We just said that. <laughs> but come here, let's talk from a fan's point of view. Um, Shamrock Rovers, top of the table last night, uh, as we were yeah. uh, for the first time this season. Um, order restored in, in your world? I think so, but I don't think... Uh, I texted Dino yesterday saying, hard luck, uh, hard luck tonight. But uh, I, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy at all. But I think Rovers made it difficult more so than Longford, to be honest. Um, I don't think we're settled in midfield just yet with our preferred midfield. He has he changed it from Tuesday evening. Uh, Gary O'Neill came back on Tuesday and Dylan Watts, and they were omitted against Longford for Chris McCann and Captain Fantastic, Ronan Finn. So I don't know if there's the same tempo with McCann and Finn as there is with O'Neill and, and Watts. So I, I, I don't know if... I Look, the, the squad is huge and I would hate to be Stephen Bradley every week picking a squad out of out of those numbers. And he has, um, he had Max Murphy from Ballybrack who made his first start of the season last Tuesday as well. And he didn't at all look out of place. I mean, he nearly scored as well. He did score in his debut away to Finn Harps last season. So there's a, it, it just a... Is that a good complaint to have though? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think like looking at it, you take Jack Bourne and Aaron McInniff out of the midfield, and that's going to be where everyone looks at Rovers and say like, can they replace that? And well, what do they do in that sort of position? And like you said, probably early on in the season, Razor's going to figure out or have a look at a couple of different com combinations there and figure out what he's got. But do you think over the course of the season, losing those two in particular could hamper the challenge to go and win another title? Or do you think it's still enough there? Like, I think there's definitely enough there, and then with Richie Tell to come in in the summer as well. Um, but like, the, I think, um, and I've heard Jack Bourne on another podcast, and he in, we interviewed Jack on our podcast as well, and he was full of praise for Dylan Watts. And I have to say, I'm a big, big fan of Dylan Watts, and I think if he's just given a, a 
a few games in a row, five, six games in a row. I th- like I think he's I think he's like he's still very young as well. Um, and Danny Mandrew as well. He's kind of I think he needs maybe five, six good five, six games uh, to get going as well. So um, I think over the court, the length of the season, thirty eight game season now. I think Jack is missed in as far as splitting defences. Like, I don't know if you agree with me, Dino, but I don't think Rovers capitalised on trying to split uh, Longford's defence last night from switching it left to right or whatever. Uh, there was plenty of opportunities where I was watching it. I was kind of going, switch it, where I think Jack Bourne might have switched it over to Sean yeah. Kavanagh in, in the in the full fullback position. And uh, I think they're probably just still getting to know each other as well. We have Sean Hoard that came in. Uh, and Sean Gannon Hora hasn't Hora's just been brilliant like but he, he didn't play last night he wasn't on the bench so there was yeah. a few games come, there was five games in two weeks so you draw the next and then the Dublin Derby next Friday against Bowles so and every every an hour before a kickoff and you're looking for the starting 11 you just don't know who it's going to be particularly in midfield but now the headaches are the, the, who the back three are going to be as well because yeah. if Joey O'Brien Lee Grace um, Pico Lopez, Sean Hoare, Liam Scales. Liam Scales is a fabulous player, and he's still only what twenty one. Yeah, Merrill. In terms of I suppose Tuesday night's game against Derry, a lot of changes. You mentioned a couple of them, and it wasn't so much that the changes were made for last night. There was a lot of players kind of put in that maybe their first opportunity this season to really get a good start under their belt. Um, was that reflective maybe of how poor Derry have been in the opening games of the season, or just badly wanting to see what's on his bench? Um, I don't know. Like, I don't think Stephen Bradley. Um, but it, it's a, do you mean like uh, because of Derry's form, he he was afforded yeah. to to bring in new pe- uh, new faces. Yeah. Um, I think he probably had the five games in a row kind of in mind more so than Derry's form. Um, and knowing that we have a big squad and a lot of those players on the bench. Darren Nugent, Max Murphy, they would have been playing week in, week out if the second team had a, had a been given the green light. Yeah. So I think he was just using his squad and I, I think he used it very well. And I think the, the game against Derry, the midfield, there was a there was a higher tempo in the midfield. Um, Gary O'Neill with passes going forward, Dylan Watts with passes going forward, where last night against Longford, I thought McCann was getting the ball and there were sideway passes and back passes and it, it, there just wasn't the same tempo as there has been with, say, O'Neill and Watts, in my opinion. I think for us, yesterday, Mero, you mentioned it, that uh, Rovers didn't really seem to switch the play all that quickly. And I think we were happy to let them be patient, you know. And I think that's, hearing Brad's on the sideline, he was he was kind of preaching that and wanting them to be patient. But it suited us to go side to side kind of slowly and let us kind of move back and forward across. Uh, again, I'll touch back on Jack Bourne. I think that's the area where he unlocks the door. And I'm not sure if there's anyone else there because you're probably going to get, like in fairness, I, th- I thought we'd done well and put up a good fight, but you're probably going to get most of your games. The opposition is going to play a little bit like us where they're going to try and kind of pack the midfield, force it to go wide and don't let them play through the middle. So who do you think is going to step up in terms of creativity, goals, Who's the player you kind of you, you see doing that role? Because you can't really do it by committee over the course of a season. I think someone has to has to take that role, don't they? Yeah, definitely. I think like there's no better opportunity to do that now as well. And and I think with the with the size of the squad, if you're going to get in, you're going to have to play to the highest standard and 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 try and replicate what Jack and Aaron brought last season. Um, in terms of who's going to step up to the creativity, I would hope the likes of uh, Dylan Watts and Danny Mandrew. Like Danny Mandrew has played every league game so far. Uh, yeah. Dylan's in and out. So, um, like I said, I think Dylan needs a, a good run of games um, to to get going and 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 show that he is creative. I mean, before Jack Bourne uh, came on the scene at Rovers, Dylan would have been a uh, free kick taker, corner taker. You know, and and we seen what he was like at Bowes as well. He like he'd score crackers. He scored crackers for us as well. So I just felt last season with Jack there, Jack was uh, dominating set pieces, and 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 Dylan wasn't. Dylan was kind of just a plan B, so to speak, if he was on the pitch at the same time. So I would hope uh, Danny Mandrew, because if you if you're watching Rovers play as well this season, Burke and, and Mandrew, they just they, they don't have a position. They play where wherever they want. Mandrew was receiving the ball off Manus last night. 
from the right side and then another time he's receiving on the left side and you're kind of going, what position is, is Manju playing? But him and Burke just seem to, seem to switch it and keep the opposition guessing. But like you were saying there as well about Longford packing the midfield, Pats did that to us as well this season and they did it to us last season where it's more so 11 men behind the ball. Because if you looked at you last night, I think in the last 15, 20 minutes, it was just like um, we we had most of the possession and it was like Longford were just waiting for the mistake, like a smash and grab mm-hmm. situation where Rovers were just dominant on the, with possession, not really doing much with it though. Not yeah. not really creating them, so it, it, I found the game though quite frustrating. The first game in, in under the under the kind of changes since Bradley, I think we played Dundalk at home a couple of years ago and lost two one. And that that game was the game where I said, Jesus, this looks good. This is like we lost, but I actually went home feeling this looks good. Like, uh, and it was the first game since then where I was kind of going, oh, I was just a bit frustrated, like. In terms of, I suppose, how the, the season goes, you mentioned Graham Burke's playing wherever he wants. He's also scoring from wherever he wants. How nice yeah. was it to him score from virtually the halfway line on Tuesday evening? Yeah, it was class. I, when when he got the ball, I wondered, uh, I wondered was he going to take a shot? And then you see him just looking up, and I could, yeah, I couldn't believe it. It was a cracker. But you've seen so many of them, though, haven't you, as well? Like, you just, a, a good player will know in that position to look up, and if they're not looking up, you you'd be more frustrated if they weren't looking up. Do you know what I mean? What's but I thought Derry were good as well, though. Derry? I don't think I don't think their performance, uh, like their position in the league, uh, if I was watching, when I was watching them on Tuesday, I didn't think they were bottom of the league. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think they've been a little bit unlucky overall that, like, they haven't picked up more points, but, that can be this league, can't it? Like you play everyone four times, and by the time you come around to play them again, like you, you know, games that they got edged out in, they might win. But you know, it's just, it's just that type of league, really. It's, it, it's time. every week. It's, it's something else. Like I mean, we shipped forward against Strada last week, and we didn't play well. But like we kind of went over statistical stuff, and you know, we we dominated possession. We had more shots. We had more crosses. We had more kind of territory than they had. But they won four nil. So. Sometimes games are like that, and I think this league is definitely like that because you don't play, because it's not a 20-team league and you play like 19 other teams twice, you're playing nine other teams, so it comes around quickly that you're playing everyone again. Like So definitely think the likes of Derry are maybe in a false position based on what they've put in so far or how they've performed so far. Yeah, I think so. I think so too. I don't, I, the league standing at the, at the moment... Uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm a Rovers fan, but I don't see it changing much. I think Sligo and Pats, I think maybe, we'll see at the break, I suppose, because Sligo and Pats tend to do, they either start bad and have a good second part of the season or vice versa. Um, Bowes, I'm not shocked with Bowes' start of the season because they lost Danny Grant, uh, Tarjek, and Andre Roy, and I don't think they, I don't think they re- replaced with the same quality. And that's no disrespect to the players that they brought in, but I don't think th- some of the players that they brought in haven't even started. Like Thomas Alua, they got from Rovers, um, hasn't started. Bastian uh, uh, Henry, who who was absolutely, a, a, he's an excellent player. Haven't seen yeah. him start yet. I don't know whether he's carrying carrying a knock or he's not fit, but I just don't think they replaced as well. So. I would say they, I can't see them. I don't know at the moment. They just can't see them getting into the top three. Graham, I suppose I agree with you. You can also add, add Danny Mandrew to that uh, list of players they've left. I I did I did disagree with you on in terms of the position. I think they will be there thereabouts at the end of the season. I think they'll come good uh, when the likes of Airy and whatever get featured in the team. Final question for you because we have run out of time. Uh, taking your Rovers hat off for a minute. Who in the, the Premier Division has impressed you, I suppose, this year? I know you've only seen how maybe a handful of the teams uh, against Rovers, but who's impressed you in terms of um, maybe surprised you positively about how they've gone about their business this year in the league? Players or teams? I think Greg Bolger at Sligo. Um, I've watched Sligo a few times. You take your Rovers hat off. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, go on. Go, go on. No, I, I just think with Sligo... Um, when Rovers travel to Sligo, it's always, 
anytime I've in in the car going to the showgrounds, me and the lads, we always we me and one of the lads, we always say, um, if we leave here with a point, I'll be happy because I think I think Sligo is a tough place to go, um, and I, I I just think they play very well. Um, I've watched two or three of their games. And I think Greg is a great sign in, in that he's commanding the midfield. He's very vocal. Um, he's The experience he's had with winning leagues um, will be brilliant. Buckley knew what he was doing there signing Greg Bolger. I was sorry to see him leave Rovers. At the same time, there's about 20 other midfielders. So he, he definitely wanted his game. Um, but so far, Sligo. But as I said, Sligo and Pats, they don't, they don't have... Sometimes they don't have the stamina for the whole full season. And I think Rovers, the la- Shamrock Rovers, the last two seasons just looked fit as a fiddle. Pat Aaron Bolger was good last night for Longford. It'd be important for us because he's a good player. Like he's good. He's he's got a he's got a great little temper about him as well. That he's got a good yeah. bite, um, mm-hmm. and he he does seem to control that. Um, um, Grimes is a Dylan Grimes is it? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, he impressed me last night when he was on the ball. Um, yeah. very tricky. Mm-hmm. He he gave Pico Lopez a bit of trouble at the start of the match. Um, Robbie Benson, I think, is. I'd like to see Robbie Benson. Um, get a good, consistent run of games. Um, some of the, some of his misses against Dundalk, I thought, Jesus, Robbie. <laughs> like I think Robbie's a great player. Georgie Kelly now, with Bowes, I'd like to see him kind of be a bit more prolific. Um, because we've heard so many times that he like. That he was a great sign and then this that and the other, but I just haven't seen it yet. Sorry, you yeah. asked who's impressed me, and I'm I'm just giving an, an analysis of of all it's these players. Impressed you? <laughs> yeah, I I just yeah I just love the league. Um, yeah. uh, Finn Harps, Mac, Mac, Barry McNamee was very good. Foley Foley's been excellent. Yeah. Foley's been excellent. Yeah. Well, Graham, listen, thanks very much for coming on, uh, for ask, for not even taking off your Rovers hat, even when we asked you to. So uh, as a, one of the fans of the league, <laughs> someone who's been chasing the Rovers around the league for the last number of years, we won't go how many. It's been a while since we crossed paths in the uh, League of Ireland circles. Yeah. And uh, thanks very much for dropping in. Cheers. No Mary. worries, lads. Best of luck. Thanks. Talk to you later. Graham Merrigan there. Uh, you probably have to travel a long, long distance to find a fan who's as much into the league and particularly into Rovers as Graham. Um, even when we asked him to take off his Rovers hat, he was just still picking out former Rovers players who'd impressed him around the league. Yeah, I think like we could have had him on for, for hours there talking about the league, couldn't we? Like Even asking for players that impressed him and, and he just kind of went into analysis of everybody in the league, really. But um, great character in the league, well-known for uh, going to games, following Rovers, obviously, over the years. And um, great to have him on here with us as well because it gives a different perspective, you know, not just um, a player and coach who can be quite intense and, and guarded like he's a fan, but he's a, he gives a different perspective as to what he's seen on the pitch and, and what he wants to see from his team. And also, like you said, he's a fan of the league overall as well, not just Rovers. Yeah, and of course, uh, we go into a very, very busy week. Another busy week. The games seem to be coming hot and heavy at the moment. Uh, full round of fixtures, Tuesday night. Year out in action, you're hosting Finn Harps in Longford. Uh, two part-time teams. Does that make a difference on a Tuesday night? Yeah, I think it's a big, big commitment for the part-time teams. Um We'll all have to arrange getting off work and, and traveling to the game on a Tuesday night to a little bit of a different preparation. So close to the, the game on Saturday as well. So in terms of recovery and, and preparation and tactically for the next game, and I'm sure Finn Harps are no different. They'll have lads trying to organize work and traveling down to, to play us on the Tuesday. Like So it makes it a, a, a difficult occasion for, for everyone involved. But um, you know that's the level of commitment it takes to play in the, in the, in the Premier Division. At the bottom of the table, two teams without a win yet this season. Derry and Dundalk, they face off at the Brandywell. Um, I hate putting stuff like this on it, but it really is do or die for, for everybody involved in, in both clubs at the moment. Yeah, I'm sure they'll both look at that and say this could be, you know, one for three points here. We could we could get three points. But um yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think Derry really need it. Um Dundalk, we're still not sure of the management structure. We don't know kind of who's gonna pick the team for that game. I think we're presuming Jim Magilton will be the next in line um, for that game anyway. But it'll be interesting to see how they go about it, um, how they compete in it. You know, 
does it affect the players? Does it affect their kind of you know commitment to getting wins and not knowing what's going to happen? I, I don't expect it to, but I think both teams will actually come into it and, and look to try and win it, and we'll see how it falls out in the end. Yeah, blows in Sligo. Dalyman hasn't been a, a very good hunting ground for Sligo Rovers in recent seasons. Um, I think I've been at the last two times the, the bit of red have played up there and they've been lost both games. So um, they'll be looking to kind of turn that around and it's been a really, really positive start to the season for Sligo. Yeah, they've been really slow and uh, hard to break down. But Bows have gone about their business quietly the last couple of weeks and kind of got back on track. And I'm sure Keith will look at that and try and you know, look at it as a chance to get another three. Um, we mentioned, obviously, travel before and midweek games. So, uh, Sligo coming across country, uh, I'd say Bowes will try and make it really difficult for them and, you know, looking to pinch the three points. But Sligo played really well, so I'm sure Liam's confident getting something and keeping the, the momentum going. Yeah, Pats and Waterford in a in a game with a, a couple of players kind of returning to the old stomping ground. Um, but Pats, they'll be hoping to continue their fine form so far this season. They're joint top of the league. Waterford slightly struggling. Uh, they'll be looking to maybe get their season up and running too. Yeah, I'm sure Stevie's looking for a win. Um, he, they, they've been really good, as we mentioned a couple of times. Look fit, look sharp. You know, getting around the pitch, covering the ground really well, playing some good stuff too. So they'll be looking for three points uh, for Waterford. It's another opportunity, though, to get points on the board, um, kickstart their season. So I'm sure they'll come with a game plan to try and get something out of the game. And uh, it'll be another good game. I think, in fairness to Waterford, a lot of young players are trying to play a little bit and Stevie's teams play too. So that should be a good footballing game. Yeah, and then Drogheda and Shamrock Rovers have complete the round on Tuesday night. Rovers, top of the table on goal difference at the moment. Drogheda, they'll be happy with their start also under Tim Clancy. Um, can you see anything but a, a Rovers win in this, though? Yeah, I could see Drogheda doing something here. Like, you know, just playing against teams, teams the last couple of years, always competitive. Started really well, signed some good players. Kept lads from last year that have done really well, and they're starting, they've started really well this year. So... I'm sure they're saying, look, we can try to get something. They probably looked at our game and, and kind of said Longford were there, thereabouts in terms of getting something. So uh, they'll look to go one better than us and try and get something in that game. From Rovers point of view, they've won the last couple and they're just starting to, I think, move through the gears a little bit. So they'll be looking for three points as well. But uh, could go anyway, really. Um, let's see, just do Rovers put the foot to the gas now and start picking up the wins, you know? Yeah, and of course, the move to the weekend is also following on the fixtures over Friday and Saturday evenings as well. I'm just going to run through the fixtures because there's obviously so many different permutations based on what happens on Tuesday that could change everything coming into the weekend. Finn Harps, they host St. Patrick's Athletic on the early kickoff on Friday evening. Shamrock Rovers and Bowes, Dublin Derby, always one to watch on Sat on Friday evening at the RT time, 7.45 kickoff on that, while your own Longford Town make the trip to Waterford at uh, 6 p.m. on Saturday evening. Dundalk and Drogheda, they've got a very special promotion they're looking to, to get you on board with this uh, weekend. The Louds Derby, first one in the league in a long time, uh, but also uh, they're donating a, a virtual attendance to uh, the Save Our Sonia campaign, which is the they're asking people to donate five euros while they're watching the stream uh, to Sonia Hoy, a former women's player with the club, uh, former FAI Cup winning goal scorer um, with the club who's having uh, health issues at the moment. More information on that from Dundalk and Drogheda on their social medias and also on our women's podcast last week. Uh, while Sligo Rovers and Derry City do battle in the another Northwest Derby, they seem to be coming thick and heavy at the moment. All those games on Saturday evening. Uh, your own game, obviously, in the middle of that there, Dean. But uh, what other games are you looking forward to over the weekend? Do you think it'd be worth checking out? Uh, well, Bowers and Rovers is obviously the standout game, isn't it? Um, you know, always, unfortunately, can't have fans in at the minute. But it was always a sellout game, always a big atmosphere, always a big build-up to the game, you know, in the media and the papers and stuff like that, which is great for the league. So that's the one, I think, that stands out for the for the weekend. Um, like you said, there'll be permutations based on what happens on Tuesday night anyway in terms of players and people fit and suspended, whatever the case may be. But... Um, it's always a good game, um, always competitive. And like you said, Bowes just find a bit of form. Rovers maybe starting to put the foot on the gas a little bit here. So that'll be a very interesting clash uh, on Friday night. Now, if we turn our eye towards the first division, obviously a round of games over the coming weekend as well. Four games Friday night, starting with the top versus bottom clash of Athlone Town and Wexford 
in Athlone Town Stadium. Cabin Teeley hosts Shells at Stradbrook, while Treat United welcome Cork City to the Markets Field. And UCD make the journey west to play Galway United. Saturday evening at 7 p.m., Cove Ramblers and Bray Wanderers will do battle at St. Coleman's Park. So it's it's a, a biz, busy weekend for everybody in the first division as well. Some great games there. Yeah, I think uh, the Galway UCD game is one I'm looking at in particular. Um, UCD playing really well, some good stuff, always good players. We mentioned John probably want a little bit more out of Galway, so um, I'm sure they'll be looking for a win uh, at home in that game. But like you said, all the games look competitive. You could turn your eye to any of them and see a good game. Um, I'm looking at Bray as well, going down to Cove. You know, it's going to be a difficult journey down there for them, and they haven't started great. But again, they could uh, nothing stopping them going down there and getting a win and kick starting their season. So I think a lot of good games there. Uh, a lot of look forward, to, a lot to look forward to for for the coming round of games. Well, that's a rundown of everything that's happening over the course of the next week. Plenty to keep us all on the edge of our seats, whether it's Watch LOI, LOI TV, or whether you're following our live commentary here on FinalWhistle.ie. Check us out on social media. Let us know your thoughts on what we had to say this week or what any of our guests had to say as well. Dean, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks, Brave. Thanks for having me again. And to everybody listening and watching on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts, thank you very much. We'll talk to you again next week.